It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur, CBS News correspondent, and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek magazine. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The North Pole used to be a no man's land, but uh, these are the days when, by buying a ticket on a commercial airliner, you can fly across the North Pole and drink a cocktail at the same time. Yet only three score or more years ago, about 35 years ago, our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, well, do you hope to see that? I do. <laughs> well, Admiral, yeah. would you say that uh, since you've been to both the extremities of Earth, are these expeditions to such far off places, are they getting easier because of modern techniques or is, still, is danger still close at hand? Well, it's a little risky, but and nothing like it used to be with the old slow planes and the small cruising radius where we had to put down bases. We replaced the dog teams and of course that was a big improvement. But now the planes go much faster and they are safer and they have a much bigger cruising radius. You haven't got the danger of a terribly heavy load. Mm -hmm. Admiral, a, an expedition to which I believe you're the advisor is now en route. Uh, what is that expedition doing? Well, that's the icebreaker ATCA. And it's a reconnaissance expedition. It's going down to the South Pole area to make certain observations and to, to look for some bases. They will be back in April and they will report back. And upon the information we get from that undertaking, uh, we will base the bigger expedition that's to follow. Uh, is that very definitely planned, or uh, is that... Uh, that is being planned right now. So I'm willing to say to you that uh, there will be a number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. Well, Admiral Byrd, I can understand, I think everybody can, the interest in the North Pole, because it's so near our greatest challenger, Soviet Russia. But why this interest in the uh, bottom of the world? Nobody living down there, is there? No, it's, um, it's pretty cold. There's only one permanent resident, that's the Emperor Penguin. The little ones live further north. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. And, uh, you know, as the world shrinks with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless, like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Uh, does it, I was going to ask you, does it have military importance? Uh, it has some, and uh, as the world shrinks, it will continue to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration. 
thus bringing these places closer. And in the future, I can see a time when it will be very, very important strategically. Well, has the development and, and of air power increased their, the strategic importance of places like the uh, oh, very much Palmer so. Peninsula? Was uh, very much so. Even now, if uh, anything happened and we uh, lost the Panama Canal, we would have to control the islands just north of Antarctica, which are part of Antarctica. Then between there and Cape Horn. I've heard it said that uh, there are seven continents in the world, and one of them has never been seen by a woman, and that's Antarctica. Is that actually true? Well, if the power Peninsula is an island, as far as I know, that's true. No woman's ever stepped foot upon the Antarctic continent, and it's the most peaceful place in the world. Well, I'm sure that <laughs> won't last very long. Uh, <coughs> today, I understand that now that you're working with the, uh, the Arnold Bread Company in charge of frozen foods. Now, is there any future for frozen foods down these frozen extremities? Well, I think the uh, human race can be helped uh, by that. Uh, this was thought out by Dean Arnold, who's, uh, in my opinion, a great humanitarian. He uh, learned that we went down there after four or five years and finished a meal that we had left there on the table when we had evacuated Little America. Everything was perfect, including the bread. So he got the idea of this frozen bread, and already he sent some to, he sent some to Europe and just very, worked very well over that for the, some of the starving people. Yes, so you can store it down in the Antarctic and against the lean years, and you wouldn't have any people in the world really starving if you did that. Yes, in the event of an atomic war... You stay there forever. Admiral, you speak of the resources of Antarctica. What are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains. It's not covered with snow. Enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals. Uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world. Now, by far, the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there, and there's evidence, probably uranium there. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fight over the Antarctic. And Robert, is there a competition among other nations to try to get information about uh, Antarctica and uh, possibly to secure some of these resources? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there are now seven nations very much interested. Russia is interested tremendously. That I'm sure of. Australia has an expedition down there. The Argentine, the Chile, New Zealand, Britain, and so on. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there, the New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans, and the Australians. And so uh, we, uh, we don't do much about claiming anything. Admiral, you uh, make this sound a little crowded. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Well, Admiral Byrd, are yeah. private expeditions a thing of the past? Is, is expedition and exploration, making expedition and exploration now a purely a government function because uh, of the tremendous no, cost organization? No, I don't think so. I think down south, it may be more or less a thing of the past, but not other, other expeditions that go there. A lot of them go north now. This latest expedition now on the way is a government expedition, I take it. Yes, that's the government. Robert, may I ask you, is there a great difference between the uh, top of the world and the bottom of the world? Uh, there north? is. Now, uh, the North Pole is the center of an ocean 10,000 feet deep. The South Pole, the center of a plateau, 10,000 feet high. The North Polar Sea is surrounded by um, continents that are slightly frozen. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by uh, a belt of ice 
frozen seas of at least 1,200 miles thick. Now, the south is a plateau. It gets, in some places, 14,000 feet up. Uh, I've been over areas about 13,000, and it's a little bit chilly up there. So there's, uh, there's that big difference between the top and bottom of the world. I don't... Con the north really isn't very cold up there on the Arctic Ocean. Not compared to the south. That Robert, we often hear it said that our young Americans now aren't as hardy as their forefathers. Do you think that Americans do measure up to the standards, uh, the physical standards and morale standards of the past? I do. I don't believe that. I think they're just as hardy. Well, what would you say was the most uh, valuable factor on expedition? Is it uh, morale or uh, physical courage or is it uh, sheer equipment? Well, I've always thought that loyalty was by far the most important trait. The British told me that when I first went down in 28, that I couldn't possibly get through the winter night without a mutiny if I took more than 20 men. But to serve science, I had to take 42 men. And then I took 56 the next time, and so on. So, and I did find that loyalty was the most important thing during the winter night when it's very hard on your nerves. Is, uh, I think that's best that's trait. Well, that's a very valuable characteristic at any time. Well, thank you very much, Admiral Bird. It's been well, a great pleasure to have you here tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was Admiral Richard E. Bird. There are many curious things found throughout recent years found within images taken by Google Earth, with some being particularly peculiar. One such find being that of a seemingly frozen ship measured at 400 feet long. It is as if it were picked up and planted upon this enormous block of frozen ice within Antarctica. Dismissed by some as simply being that of a naturally formed block of ice, Yet the resemblance to a cruise liner is unquestionably uncanny. If indeed a ship like the one we have covered previously, an old lifeboat found in the 70s within an inescapable lagoon within the interior of Bouvi Island, one of the most inhospitable and remote places on Earth, ravaged almost yearly by storms, with no explanation as to how it arrived there. This ship would undoubtedly raise similar questions. Some conspiracy theorists even putting forward the posit that it is possibly the remnants of a Nazi vehicle, a theory linked to a base long claimed to have been created down here during the Second World War. Whatever the answer, questions regarding this curious find remain. Could this really be a ship literally frozen solid in an almost impossible location? And if so, where did it come from, and how did it get to where it rests now? We find this discovery highly compelling. During the last few years, reports have begun to circulate regarding a joint team of American and European explorers in the Antarctic. Around 20 kilometers across the Antarctic border, this team of non-governmental explorers actually confirmed the existence of a set of three ancient stone block pyramids peering out from beyond the shrinking ice. The preliminary finding was even published in the press, yet all subsequent information on the find has been silenced. Possible aerial photographs of the location may have been leaked, as there are some very compelling images of pyramidal ruins in Antarctica now circulating the web. American and European governments have attempted to shrug off the accusations as absurd. However, as more and more specialists are converted by substantial evidence within Egypt as to the sheer age of the Sphinx and pyramids, many researchers now conclude that these huge ancient structures found around the world were most likely built prior to the last ice age. 
Additionally, fossilized ancient palm tree pollen has been found in numerous sites within Antarctica, confirming it was once much warmer than it is today, making it highly possible that past civilizations did indeed inhabit this now frozen continent. The Pyreres map is another compelling piece of artifactual evidence to suggest that past cultures had an intimate knowledge of the Antarctic coast before it was coated in ice. A map built from the vast ancient literature once housed, and subsequently destroyed in the wrecking of Alexandria's library, knowledge which could have proved the existence of this past culture. Ancient pyramidal sites dot every continent of Earth, the only continent governments strongly deny the existence of any ancient ruins whatsoever is Antarctica. Just what are they hiding in Antarctica? There just happens to have been some very strange visitations to the Antarctic as of late. In the past year alone, countless top officials from Russia, America, religious groups, and other official bodies from around the world have been quietly visiting the continent in succession, with no substantial reasons for their visits being given. Have they found an ancient city perfectly preserved in the ice? Maybe an ancient advanced technology, maybe even a stargate. The question is, will we ever be told? Our conjecture that there is a lost yet once highly advanced ancient civilization could be proven beyond doubt by one continent in particular. Antarctica, for many millennia, this land has been encased, perfectly preserved, laying beneath miles of ancient ice. The Piri Rees map, something which we have discussed in the past, has long been argued to prove just that long claimed as showing that of the landmass of Antarctica free of ice. If true, it would have been impossible to have created, according to modern paradigm, thought to have originated from the embers of the Great Fire of Alexandria, this catastrophe a tragic loss to man's understanding of our own origins. Yet this map survived, clearly displaying what many believe to be the continent of Antarctica before becoming what is now a frozen ice cap at the pole of our planet. It is now an incredibly inhospitable place, one of the reasons we feel there may be intact, undisturbed ruins which may dot the land, known to be the driest place on Earth, and in addition to this compelling possibility of submerged yet highly advanced ruins, there may be many other unexplained anomalies that, due to their incredibly remote geographical placement, across some of the world's now most impenetrable natural obstacles, recording some of the lowest temperatures on Earth, if proven beyond doubt to exist, would be proof of a preserved pre-Ice Age existence for advanced man. Yet due to this immense cold, and the fact that it is a largely unexplored tundra capable of killing even the most experienced of explorers, Many things which rest here remain unexplored. Yet just like that of the face of the moon, one must ask the question, just what could be laying there, buried within or resting upon this giant ice sheet many miles deep? Objects just like the anomalies discovered in Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947, which, although strongly argued by officials, as that of a United States Army Air Force's balloon which crashed at tremendous velocity at a ranch near Roswell, which many claim was in fact a UFO which crashed, would inevitably be covered up by whatever power was capable of not only visiting such anomaly, but retrieving it. Crashing into the seemingly endless tundra, and our next item of interest could behold just as controversial in origin as that of the causation for what many claim as the Roswell Conspiracy, a truth so controversial only top military personnel would be privy to. This remarkable image taken by satellite clearly displays an as yet unexplored anomaly. Resting at the basin of a hilltop, it presumably crashed into with its velocity upon impact sliding the mysterious object down the side of the mountain. When other such objects have been discovered in the past, indeed in the same way as that of amateur sleuths, poring over satellite images looking for these exact features, military vehicles have been later snapped at these same locations, unquestionable proof of the world's government's interest in such discoveries, not only due to the environment 
but also its remoteness. Found in permanently frozen areas could mean that if such objects do indeed turn out to be that of an alien craft, could also be in a condition to be successfully reversed-engineered if not repaired by man. A technological explosion would inevitably occur. A lucrative operation indeed. So, we find it curious that several such events have been claimed to have occurred since 1947. Could this also be posited to be as a result of this exact claim scenario? Discovered, retrieved, reverse-engineered, and finally either adapted for military purpose or commercial profits. What is this thing laying far away in the frozen Antarctic? Is it indeed a crashed alien vehicle? We find the anomaly highly compelling. In July 2012, a curious Google Earth image was discovered by Russian UFO researcher Valentin de Tarim. The image quickly made its way around the media, with varying reactions. Andrew Fleming from the British Antarctic Survey told the UK newspaper The Mail Online that the object was clearly a simple crevasse in the ground. They can be tens of meters deep, nothing unusual, it's certainly not a UFO. Well, it seems he may be right. However, an image purporting to be from the same site taken one year earlier has been uncovered. Researchers looking at previous satellite images of the same site taken in April and December 2011, found what appeared to be four massive vehicles parked in the snow, pointed towards a mysterious object. There appears to be more than a simple crevasse going on in this image. What appears to be going on is that a huge scientific research center has been deployed to a meaningless location in an icy desert. Which just so happens to be by an object and strange feature in the ice, that looks all for the world like a crashed aircraft pattern, only for it to completely vanish a year later. What should we make of these earlier satellite images? While some reports identify the shapes as tanks, if they really are vehicles, they're massive in size, probably around 70 feet in length. There are no tire tracks, but they could have been covered by snow or blown away. They look more like research centers, also note the drift patterning around them towards the object, is this camouflage canvas, why are all the drifts in the same direction and none on the other side of the vehicles? Is it a crashed alien craft? If it was, I would have definitely filled in the hole afterwards, 